Good evening, everyone. I know there's people still in the back, and there's chairs here up front, so come on up. So I'm Serene Jones, and it's my privilege as president of Union Theological Seminary to welcome you to the launch of Social Democracy in the Making, Political and Religious Roots of European Socialism by Dr. Gary, Gary Dorian, the Reinhold Niebuhr Professor of Social Ethics here at Union. An alum of Union, having received his MDiv and PhD, Gary teaches social ethics, theology, philosophy of religion, and just about every other topic you could imagine being taught at a seminary. He is the author of more than 20 books and 300 articles including field-shaping, multi-volume accounts of American liberal theology and the black social gospel. I'll tell you, I travel around the country, indeed the world, um, talking to people about union, meeting with alums and supporters of unions, and there is one question among the many that I am always asked almost right off the bat, and that is, how on earth does Gary Dorian write so many brilliant books? And I still don't have the answer to that, except he is a remarkable writer, thinker, intellectual, visionary, and teacher. So, yes. So he's going to be lecturing tonight from this most recent book that's being published by Yale University Press. And this book is destined to become the definitive account of the history and the legacy and the future of democratic socialism. In the past, Gary's work has been recognized as a choice award in 2010 for social ethics in the making, a prose award in 2013 for Kantian Reason and Hegelian Spirit, and in 2017 with the Gronmeyer Award, the highest honor bestowed on a work of theology or religious studies for his book, The New Abolition, W.E.B. Du Bois and the Black Social Gospel. Gary's contributions to the field of social ethics and theology are, in short, unrivaled. Indeed, Cornell West describes him as the preeminent social ethicist in North America, indeed the world today. If that weren't enough, Gary is also a beloved teacher here at Union, whose classes, none of, whom, none of which are required, are always brimful, and he has advised dozens and dozens of PhD students many of whom are teaching across the country. He's also an Episcopal priest to whom the community turns here, not just for prophetic insight, but for care and wisdom as well. And he is a good friend, my brother in theology and in activism and as a fellow leader and journeyer here at Union Theological Seminary. We're excited to have Gary talk about this timely and important work on democratic socialism, which he reminds us was, as in its start, Christian socialism that paved the way for all liberation theologies that make the struggle of the oppressed people the subject of redemption. This book, in which he argues for a decentralized economic democracy and an anti-imperial internationalism, is available for purchase after the discussion in the back with the help from Book Culture. Thank you, Book Culture. We love you. Um, this evening, we're going to hear first from Gary, um, and then we will have responses by our two guests, whom I'm going to introduce now. 
Um, first, we have the very Reverend Dr. Dean Kelly Brown Douglas, who is the Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union. Uh, she is a dear sister friend, a leading voice in the development of womanist theology. She has published widely in national and international journals. Her publication list is long and wide. Her groundbreaking and widely used book, Sexuality and the Black Church, A Womanist Perspective, was the first to address the issue of homophobia within the black community. And her latest book, Stand Your Ground, Black Bodies and the Justice of God, examines the deep roots of Stand Your Ground culture in America, its racist past, and the challenges it brings to the black church community, indeed, to all of us today. And she also is a teacher, a prophetic presence, a counselor, a wisdom guider, um, and an all-around amazing presence here at Union. And we also have Dr. Jeffrey Kurtz, who is Associate Professor of Political Science at the Borough of Manhattan Community College, where he has focused his work on the American social democratic tradition and European social democracy. We're very glad to have you here. Jeff is an editor of Democratic Socialists of America's Religion and Socialism blog and an edi editor of Jean Jarret, The Interlife of Social Democracy. Thank you for being here. And so now I ask us to get started by having our esteemed author come to the podium and address us. Serene, thank you for that generous, kind introduction, which is so characteristic of you. To my beloved friends in the theology field who dreamed up this event and sponsored it, Sarah Azaransky, John Tatomino, Andrea White, Jerusa Rhodes, Roger Haight, and Tara Chung Hyun Kyun. To my friends at EDS at Union, who came on as a co-sponsor, especially our great dean and my treasured friend, Kelly Brown Douglas, and to the Religion and Socialism Group of DSA, which also came aboard, especially my longtime friend, Maxine Phillips, who put out the word that brought Jeffrey Kurtz to us tonight, and to those generous friends at Union who organized this event, especially Sarah Azaransky, Ian Rees, Miguel Escobar, Benjamin Perry, Chris McFadden. Thank you so much to one and all. This event is a wondrous blessing. Democratic socialism <clears throat> is an idea with a rich history in European politics and a slight history in U.S. American politics. Yet this idea is surging today in the USA, partly because we have so little of it. European social democracy has created societies in which government pays for everybody's health care and education. In the USA, we attained only a modicum of social democratic decency through the New Deal and great society, and now even that is endangered. Voting rights are suppressed in black and Latinx communities. Health care depends upon what you can afford. Democratic institutions are under assault. Racism and xenophobia are assiduously politicized. Private money dominates the political system, and nothing is done to stem severe inequalities of wealth and income. No democracy can perpetually survive gross disparities in economic and social condition. Thus, the United States is witnessing a surge of democratic socialism. Social democratic standards of social decency are said to be un-American. 
but nearly every election is a referendum on them. And the USA has the richest cultural history of democratic socialism in the world. Americans have long debated two fundamentally different versions of what kind of country the U.S. should aspire to be. One is the vision of a society that provides unrestricted liberty to acquire wealth, lifts the right to property above the right to self-government, and espouses the politics of individual competition and success. The other is the vision of a realized democracy in which self-government is superior to property, no group dominates any other, and democratic checks are placed on social, political, and economic power. Both of these visions are ideal types, deeply rooted in U.S. American history. Both have limited and conditioned each other for two centuries. Donald Trump won the presidency by claiming that liberal government, liberal elites, and the media have betrayed the nation by coddling immigrants and denigrating the white heartland communities that made America great. He told his vaunted base that the wrong people are succeeding in American society and white Americans must reclaim their country before it is lost. Trump has changed how the Republican Party talks about Vision One, giving highest priority to racism, white anxiety, xenophobia, cultural resentments, and Trump's consuming narcissism. But that just makes Trumpism a meaner and degraded version of Vision One. The original idea of socialism goes back to the 1820s in France and England where Charles Fourier and Robert Owen were the pioneers. The original idea was to achieve the unrealized demands of the French Revolution, which never reached the working class. Instead of pitting workers against each other, a cooperative mode of production and exchange would allow them to work for each other. Socialism was about organizing society as a cooperative community. That could mean very different things as espoused and evidenced by the work of Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, Mikhail Bakunin, Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels, Ferdinand LaSalle, William Morris, Karl Kotsky, <clears throat> Sidney Webb, Edward Bernstein, Rosa Luxemburg, V.I. Lenin, Eugene Debs, G.D.H. Cole. These founders blamed capitalism for all of society's ills, but religious socialists did not. So there were Christian and Jewish versions of nearly every socialist tradition. Engels and Kotsky drew from Marx's thought the principles that came to be called Orthodox Marxism, a necessary enterprise riddled with the usual problems of orthodoxies. No definition of socialism as economic collectivism or state control of the economy or any particular ownership scheme is common to the many traditions of socialist thought. Historically, Marxism played the leading role in reducing the idea of socialism to collective ownership, and Fabian socialism played the second leading role in a very different way. Marx taught that the structure of economic ownership determines the character of an entire society and socialism is the collective ownership of the means of production, a sufficient condition for fulfilling the essential aspirations of human beings. He developed the most powerful <clears throat> and illuminating critique of capitalism ever conceived, inspiring numerous traditions of Marxian criticism. His focus on the factors of production and the structural capitalist tendency to generate crises of overproduction and crash made permanent contributions to socialist thought. But Marx's dogmatic determinism, catastrophe mentality, and doctrine of proletarian dictatorship wrecked immense harm. He developed his theory during an era in which democracy was merely a form of government and thus of very low importance to him. 
His denigration of moral everything obscured his own ethical wellspring. And his fixation on collective ownership relegated anti-racism, feminism, and all other social justice causes to secondary reform movement status. Every kind of socialism retains the original idea of organizing society as a cooperative community. Yet there is no core that unites the many schools of socialism or democratic socialism, and democracy is as complex and variable as socialism. I believe that the best candidate for an essential something in democratic socialism is the ethical commitment to social justice and radical democratic community. This impulse retains the original socialist idea in multiple forms, inspiring struggles for freedom, equality, recognition, and democratic commonwealth. Fourier said that all liberal constitutions were flawed because they lifted an abstract equality of rights above the necessary means to realize these rights. The first right of every citizen is to sustainable work. The cooperative traditions of Fourier and Owen carried well beyond their European origins, inspiring U.S. American radical Democrats and progressives to dream of a society based on cooperative ethical values. Many founders of the Republican Party identified with Fourier or Marx, linking racial slavery to capitalism. Some of them knew Marx personally. To them, European socialism was far from un-American. If the USA was to become a decent society that broke the nexus of slavery and economic domination, it had to extinguish America's original sin and prevent capital from dominating later. Democratic socialism, the term itself, bears the fateful history of socialism in its self-conscious utterance. Most 19th century British and continental socialists believed that capitalism is antagonistic toward democracy and socialism is intrinsically democratic. However, the latter belief was construed in contrasting ways. Marxists contended that existing democracy was a bourgeois fraud and real democracy would emerge only from a proletarian revolution, after which there would be no need of a state. For a socialist to lionize democracy as the best road to socialism was ridiculous. Democracy would come by making the state irrelevant, as Marxists believed, or by smashing the state, as anarchists believed. Democratic socialists refused to subordinate democracy and its reform causes to a catastrophe vision of deliverance or the demands of a left-wing dictatorship. They said socialists had to be resolutely democratic on their way to achieving socialism and not merely on tactical grounds. Edward Bernstein made the classic case for this position in 1899 in the German Social Democratic Party, SPD. He rocked the SPD by doing so and was tagged as a revisionist betrayer of Marxism. The terms democratic socialist and revisionist have been linked ever since. But revisionism is not another name for democratic socialism. Revisionism names the periodic necessity of adjusting the socialist idea to real world circumstances. Democratic socialism and social democracy became slightly different things after democratic socialists insisted that democracy is the means and end of socialism. The social democrats who founded the Socialist International in 1889 believed that socialist revolutions were inevitable wherever capitalism arose. Meanwhile, they puzzled that no socialist revolution had occurred in any advanced capitalist society. Democratic socialism and social democracy became somewhat different things because the founders were wrong about socialist revolutions occurring in all industrialized societies, or any at all. 
The democratic socialist vision of democratized power is more radical than the social democracies that democratic socialists create when they gain power. Sooner or later, the gap between the idea and the politics, when it grows too wide, demands a revision of the idea and usually the politics. In Social Democracy in the Making, I analyze the European history of this logic. The revisionist watersheds in Germany were 60 years apart. The Bernstein drama of 1899 and the SPD's pullback in 1959 to Bernstein's pluralistic ethical socialism. In Sweden, a similar watershed occurred in 1928 under Per Albin Hansen, who built the model European Social Democratic Party, a Swedish powerhouse that crafted a third way between capitalism and Marxism. In Britain, Marxism was not much of a factor, and the orthodoxy in question, to the extent that there was one, was Fabian. Thus, the parallel benchmark came later, in 1955, when Hugh Gateskill took over the Labour Party and sought to replace Fabian ideology with pluralistic economic democracy and Britain's historic ethical socialist traditions. Each of these revisionist episodes was a creative response to a stagnant orthodoxy and a blow to the conviction that socialism names something definite. Today, every social democratic and workers party is struggling to rethink its mission in the face of economic globalization and backlash movements based on racism and xenophobia. In Germany, the SPD has capitulated to neoliberal capitalism and become habituated, apparently, to its junior partner alliance with the Conservative Party. In Sweden, the Social Democratic Party has disavowed its historic attempt to democratize major enterprises, the Meidner Plan, which folded in 1992 after a 10-year run. But Germany has co-determined enterprises and a comprehensive welfare state. And Sweden, Denmark, and Norway have high wages, strong unions, free education, monthly stipends to undergraduates, 400 days of paid leave when a child is born or adopted, and vibrant economies that are one-fourth publicly owned. The U.S. had vibrant, radical democratic traditions before and after Europeans invented socialism. American radical Democrats began to call themselves socialists in the 1850s after German immigrants created the first formerly socialist American organizations. German American Social Democrats were the heart of the Socialist Labor Party, founded in 1877. Christian socialism sprawled across the nation in the 1880s and 90s, often taking a populist form. Populists railed against banks and monopoly trusts, calling for silver dollars. They founded powerful organizations and parties of their own. They seeped into the Democratic Party, and they often converted to socialism or Christian socialism. Very soon after, the Socialist Party of Eugene Debs was founded in 1901, it was a wondrous stew of radical Democrats, neo-abolitionists, Marxists, Christians, populists, feminists, trade unionists, industrial unionists, single taxers, anarcho-syndicalists, and Fabians, both American-born and coming from every European nation and Russia. German trade unionists created a powerful socialist tradition in Milwaukee, where social democracy was a culture, not merely a cause. Jewish garment workers from Russia and Russian Poland created similar organizations in New York, espousing a universalistic creed in Yiddish. Rebellious tenant farmers in Oklahoma, red populists in Texas, syndicalist miners in Colorado and California, and populist socialists across the Midwest and West built a sprawling network of periodicals, summer camps, and state parties. The leading socialist periodical, Appeal, Appeal to Reason, was published in Kansas 
and top 900,000 subscribers in its heyday. The national ripsaw morphed out of appeal to reason and reached a similar audience of farmers, populists, Christian socialists, and rebels. The Jewish Daily Forward was the Bible of New York Jewish socialism, averaging 150,000 subscribers for decades. Scores of socialist weeklies had upwards of 30,000 subscribers, showing that socialism had no trouble speaking American. One of them, the Texas Rebel, one of my favorites, fairly raged to its 30,000 readers that if you really believe in government of the people, by the people, and for the people, you have to be a democratic socialist. In fact, you are one. This wondrous American socialism was destroyed in 1917 and 1919. The Socialist Party bravely opposed World War I and paid a horrific price for it. Then the meteor of world communism crashed into the Socialist Party and just blew it apart. Socialists tried afterward to build a farmer labor socialist progressive party. In Canada, they succeeded. Here they failed. They watched Franklin Roosevelt steal 90% of their platform, which he hadn't run on, and disastrously opposed him afterwards. Had the socialists built a farmer labor party or pulled Roosevelt to the left, it would not have been possible to claim that democratic socialism is impossibly un-American. Today, the reckoning has come for missed opportunities. That's what my new book is going to be about, not this one that came out yesterday, the one after, the one that's coming. <clears throat> I was an organizer through the 1970s who started writing books about economic democracy in the 1980s. So I have yearned for this reckoning for quite some time. I grew up in a semi-rural, lower-class area of mid-Michigan where nobody talked about going to college or having a career. My parents came from similarly poor areas of Michigan's Upper Peninsula, where my father had sisters, brothers, and a mother who were obviously Native American, so he moved away to see if he could pass as racially indeterminate. The most loving thing he ever did was to claim for his children all the white privilege he could get for them. Today, my father is proudly, even aggressively, Native American. But I am a child of the white lower class, having never experienced or claimed any other racial identity. Martin Luther King Jr. crashed through my world before I knew much of anything about politics or religion or anything beyond Bay County. I squeaked into college because of sports. And then for 25 years, I worked in various solidarity organizations, especially C-SPACE, and founded and led chapters of the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee, DSOC, and DSA. In the 1970s, I tried to recruit Cornell West to DSOC, but DSOC was more old left than new left, and Cornell was not going to hang out with old left social democrats. Most of us who were leaders in DSOC had friends who felt the same way. So in 1982, we founded DSA, fusing DSOC with the New American Movement, NAM. Michael Harrington was our leader, but now we also had leaders like Barbara Ehrenreich, Manning Marable, and Cornell West. The whole idea of DSA was to move beyond the sectarianism of the socialist past, creating a good-spirited, multi-tendency organization that fostered a culture of mutual respect and inclusion. I have now reached the crossroads of this talk. From here, I can go in about 20 directions. 
And I'm going to spin a thread that connects my new book to EDS at Union and DSA and the sequel that's coming on American Democratic Socialism. One of the two main strands of social democracy in the making is the intertwined tradition of democratic socialism and Christian socialism in Britain. The richest tradition of Christian socialism is the British one. It goes back to the 1840s, founded by the iconic Anglican trio of Frederick Denison Morris, John Ludlow, and Charles Kingsley. Morris argued that cooperation is the moral law of the divine order. Socialism reflects the divine order by creating a cooperative society. Ideologically, the first Christian socialists were in the cooperative tradition of Robert Owen, sometimes with a French inflection. Fatefully, they clashed with each other over consumer cooperatives, state financing for producer cooperatives, and cooperative syndicates. Is socialism only about the mode of production? Do we want the state to finance cooperatives? Shouldn't socialism be less divisive than capitalism? These questions thwarted the first wave of Christian socialism in the 1850s. The second wave, the second mighty wave in the 1880s was mostly Anglo-Catholic. Many Anglican socialists were stubbornly cooperative in the Owen and Morris mode. Some joined the Fabian movement after it arose in 1884. Some joined the social union reformers who came out of Oxford. Some gave highest priority to socializing land. A great many joined the Workers' Party movement after it arose in 1893. And some became leaders of the Guild Socialist movement that just took off in 1912. But Christian socialism had an ethical wellspring that qualified its commitment to all these ideologies. Christian socialists were committed to an ethic of equality, freedom, and, e and cooperative community. They denied that a Fabian or syndical or social unionist or Marxist ideology was more binding than their ethical convictions. England had deep traditions of Christian socialism and secular ethical socialism long before it acquired a workers' party or a Marxist tradition. In 1893, a Christian socialist labor leader, Keir Hardy, founded the Independent Labor Party, ILP, the forerunner of the Labor Party, which compelled many socialists to make an excruciating choice. Should they stay in the radical wing of the Liberal Party or join the party of actual workers. A workers party might be a disaster for anti-imperialism and anti-racism. Joining the ILP might destroy the anti-imperialist wing of the Liberal Party and it might hand the government to the Tories, which in fact it did. Christian socialists S.G. Hobson, Charles Marson, and Conrad Noel replied that Christian socialists had to be with the workers and convert them to anti-imperialism, anti-racism, and anti-militarism. Meanwhile, the Fabian Society became an activist powerhouse led by sociologist Sidney Webb, his partner Beatrice Webb, and literary star George Bernard Shaw. They said British socialism didn't need Marx's glorification of revolutionary violence or any of his exotic doctrines. All it needed was to proceed on its present course. The reach of government grew every year. This process was relentless, beneficial, and supposedly civilizing. It tamed the predatory impulses of capitalism, making society rational. Soon, the flow of progress would civilize England and the entire world. All good liberals, progressives, ethical socialists, radical Democrats, and radical Tories of the late Victorian era believed the world was progressing toward higher forms of civilization and democracy. Even Marxists held a vision of this idea of progress. The Fabians turned this belief into an argument for bureaucratic state collectivism. Socialism 
was government ownership directed by elite managers, that is, Fabians. <clears throat> but Christian socialists and ethical socialists fit their ideology to their ethical convictions, not the other way around. Even those who joined the Fabian society fought for the ethical difference wherever it arose. It arose repeatedly over imperialism and racism. All Britons were schooled in the lore of the British Empire, a tale of mercantile colonization under the Stuarts and Cromwell, war victories against the Dutch, French, and Spanish in the 17th century, the acquisition of Eastern North America, the St. Lawrence Basin in Canada, numerous territories in the Caribbean, slave trading outposts in Africa, commercial interests in India, and Israelis' incursions of the 1870s into Egypt, India, Afghanistan, and South Africa. In the 1880s, the great ethical socialist John Hobson said a new kind of imperialism was emerging that had to be opposed differently than the old kind. Anti-imperialists conceived empire as a problem of power lust and military overreach that's cured by liberal politics. Tories were the bad party because they were shameless imperialists. Hobson said the new imperialism was driven by fierce economic competition for new markets. He wrote about this historical turn as it occurred, publishing 10 books before he wrote his famous book, Imperialism, in 1902. He contended that modern capitalism is just unsustainable without exploiting colonized markets. Hobson did not say that economics explains everything. He made moral and political arguments, providing sermon material for Christian socialists. Scott Holland, Charles Gore, Charles Marson, and Conrad Noel blasted the Boer War and the plunder of Africa, and they fought against Webb, Webb, and Shaw for touting their patriotism with racist arguments. British Christian socialists were strong anti-imperialists because their deepest convictions were ethical religious, and they lived in the belly of the beast. Some of them made bishop anyway. Hobson was slow to acquire American readers, but after Europe plunged into World War I, W.E.B. Du Bois leaned on Hobson and the British socialists to explain what was happening. In 1875, the European powers controlled one-tenth of the African continent. By 1900, they had devoured virtually the entire continent. Hobson said the plunder of Africa relied on the equation of color with inferiority. Du Bois said, this is not one factor on a list. This is the crucial thing. The European powers took an important lesson from the British and American slave trades. The pillage and rape of Africa could be called something else if black people were less than human. France sought to build a northern African empire stretching from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea. Germany sought colonies in Africa and Asia. Portugal renewed and expanded its historic claims to African territory. Hobson showed that Western movements for democracy and progress played crucial roles in accelerating the flow of finance capital to far off lands, thus ratcheting up the clash of empires. Democracy was supposed to be the answer to the terrible problems of inequality, exploitation, and oppression. The ship of state was supposedly launched on the great tide of democratic expansion. Yet as democracy spread, so did the rule of might, regardless of which party won office. Democracy and imperialism just grew together, unless what? In England, the Labour Party became the vehicle of the ethical socialist and Christian socialist answer. In the USA, Du Bois joined the Socialist Party, but Eugene Debs said as little as possible about racial justice. Debs had a simplistic, magical, semi-Marxist concept of socialism as the cure for all social problems. 
Since only socialism would abolish racism, he fixed solely on the struggle for socialism. The sophistry of that approach just galled the boys, driving him out of the Socialist Party, although he voted many times for Debs and Norman Thomas. Du Bois did not sneer at the democratic faith of radical liberals and socialists because he shared it. He was a progressive who believed in radical democracy. But he cautioned that the seemingly paradoxical wedding of democracy and imperialism was not really puzzling. White workers were asked to share the spoils of exploiting people of color. The chief exploiter role that formerly belonged to the merchant prince passed to the aristocratic monopoly, then passed to the capitalist class, and now belonged to the democratic nation. Du Bois said the only solution to this miserable picture was for democratic socialism to reach all the way to the poor and excluded, not stopping with white workers. The movements for socialism, union organizing, and democracy had made a beginning. The capitalist class would yield to the unions as long as it found new markets to exploit. The national bond was no longer based on something flimsy like patriotism or loyalty or ancestor worship. It was based on the wealth that creates a middle class and flows to the working class. But most of this new wealth rested on the exploitation of Asians, Africans, South Americans, and West Indians. Du Bois believed that the old capitalist exploitation was fading, and it was not the reason why Germans and Britons were slaughtering each other in France. Socialism was advancing in Germany and Britain, yet both governments just took for granted their right to rule and exploit non-white peoples. World War I was about which group of white nations would do so. Du Bois acknowledged that Japan did not play along because Japan demanded white treatment without allying with white nations. China, too, was increasingly independent, complicating the Western domination of China. But everything depended on how far the logic of democracy extended. Du Bois put it plainly. If progressive movements accelerated the imperial logic of modern capitalism, the only solution was to universalize democratic socialism. If the movements for liberalism, unionism, anti-imperialism, and socialism were to create a different world, they had to struggle for democratic socialism everywhere. Quote, we must go further. We must extend the democratic ideal to the yellow, brown, and black peoples, unquote. Du Bois implored that democracy is distinctly powerful and transformative. First, the movements for democratic socialism had to win power wherever they existed. Then they had to fulfill the universalism of their creed. Otherwise, socialism was the worst form of hypocrisy. Du Bois believed that for the rest of his life. The universality of the socialist idea was not a problem for him. The problem was the lack of it. I wrote most of this book during the period that Bernie Sanders first ran for president. I spent a lot of time that year talking to reporters about how Bernie conceives democratic socialism and why he won so much support. Day after day, he conveyed his gut-level rage that the system is rigged to siphon most of the wealth to exceedingly rich people. I loved him for it, even as I lamented his limitations. Bernie sings in one key only, and he never broke through to African American voters, which caused many of us to regret that he never had to try until he ran for president. But his achievement in his previous run for office is already historic. It changed the discussion in the Democratic Party. It put AOC on her path to Congress. In Bernie's candidacy, 
The Democratic Party belatedly reckoned with its tepid conformity to neoliberalism and the donor class. This time, I am waiting for Stacey Abrams to make a decision. But Bernie Sanders epitomizes stubborn ethical radicalism. He doesn't conduct a poll to find out what he believes. He doesn't have to decide from week to week who he's going to be. He demonstrates the power of holding to quite simple ethical socialist values with conviction. In this respect, he is very similar to the leading British socialist of the 20th century, R.H. Tawney, albeit with some of the same limitations. Tawney expounded three basic principles. All human beings possess God-given equal worth and dignity. Socialism is moral and democratic, and freedom and equality go together, for inequality curtails freedom. Tawney said, the worst thing about economic inequality is that it excludes people from society and social goods, not that some people have more money than others. A good society makes public provisions that recognize the equal dignity and rights of all citizens. Equality is the antidote to privilege, which is a function of interrelated social and economic power, and democratizing power is the antidote to tyranny, which is a function of the distribution of power. The goal is for human freedom and fellowship to flourish by democratizing eco economic and social power. Tawney was tireless in the Bernie Sanders fashion, constantly repeating that a good society respects people for what they are, not for what they own. It provides for all children what parents want for their children. Tawney was a Christian socialist. His best friend was a famous Anglican theologian, William Temple, another democratic socialist. But Tawney chafed at the label because he was pluralistic about religion and not about socialism. For Tawney, as for Du Bois, socialism was universal. Everybody should be a socialist. A great deal of the literature on Christian socialism dismisses it as ethical idealism, often with a quote from Marx or Reinhold Niebuhr. I am much more impressed by stubborn ethical conviction because it is the crucial thing, and in many contexts, it's the only alternative to despair or selling out or giving up. The struggle for economic democracy and inclusion has been left to stubborn types who learn from the history and failures of social democracy. Thank you, friends. Good evening. Let me begin by saying how lucky I am to have as a colleague and friend, Gary Dorian, whose integrity of scholarship reflects the integrity of his person. With a humility of spirit and passion for excellence, as well as an instinctive commitment to what is just and right. Gary pushes all of us who have the honor to work with and know him toward our better selves as scholars and as people, even as he makes this union community better through his quiet but profound presence. And so tonight, it is a privilege to offer my reflections on this sure to be widely read book, Social Democracy in the Making. 
Gary, let me also begin my brief remarks by congratulating you for yet another groundbreaking book that unearths a long ignored, if not forgotten, theological history that is important not simply for the academy, but for the church and its role in moving us toward a more just earth, as we like to say here at EDS Union, as well as helping us all to think more deeply about what a just earth, a just society might look like. I will offer only a few thoughts of the importance of this book for the church, more specifically, the church communion of which you and I are a part, the Anglican communion. Now, Gary, as essential to our worship tradition, especially during this season of Lent, I must begin with a confession. When you sent me the 600-page manuscript for this book, I thought, OMG, what have I gotten myself into? I prayed that this book be, be page-turning good, since I will also confess to not coming to it with a particular interest in the history of democratic socialism. And so as I opened the book, expecting to find meticulous, insightful, theological and historical scholarship, and I did, I also found myself caught in a page-turning story of not only a theological, cultural, historical movement, but of the complicated and quirky people behind the movement. Who knew that as brilliant a mind that Maurice was, he was perhaps equally as muddle-headed, as you quote positive historian Frederick Harrison as saying. Or who knew that he grew up with a family that communicated their religious beliefs to each other through writing letters to themselves. Even as you reminded us that Maurice founded Queens College, the first college in England to admit women. And who knew? that it was his young Billy Temple self, as you describe him, who was buoyant, friendly, self-confident, and expressive, that often showed himself in the itself in the serious scholar William Temple through Temple's uproarious laughter that you said some considered unbearable, while others believed it a valuable compliment to his deep seriousness. And how I enjoyed reading about the tangled story, as you put it, that was Bart's theological journey, as you describe, rather than the dramatic conversions that Bart would put forward. So with dexterous brilliance, Gary, you made this densely theologically intricate and historically complicated story of social democracy into an actual page turner. For that, I thank you. Now let me say something about this book's import for the church, the Anglican church, especially for these times in which we now find ourselves. Even as you remind us that Christian socialism paved the way for those of us who do a theology of liberation, and much to my delight that Carl Smith did not invent political theology, you make clear the deep roots of Christian socialism in England that began, as you've just told us, in 1848 with a group of Anglican theologians led by F.D. Maurice. In so doing, you, in fact, lift up a tradition that has been ignored. I ignored, I think, to our peril as we navigate the realities of what it means to be a global church in the world. Essentially, you have reminded us that as perhaps more conservative theological voices rise in our church, particularly around issues of sexuality and or the church's relationship to the public square of politics, you remind us that those whom many consider the classical thinkers would perhaps be seen today as radical. In other words, you have reminded us of the radical politic that is classical Anglican theology. Who knew? 
Thus, in this book, you bring forward an Anglican theological tradition, which is, as you rightly say, worth renewing today. This is a tradition that saw a compatibility between that essential something, as you put it, of democratic socialism and Christianity, which was nothing less than an ethical passion for justice in a democratic community. That is one where, as you say, every citizen is free, equal, and included, which for one like Maurice meant co cooperation and fellowship. Thus, even as one like Maurice eschewed conflict and the divisiveness of politics, he recognized the perhaps inevitable, if not inextricable, relationship between the demands, if you will, of the kingdom of Christ and the clerical church involvement in the public square. As you say, he believed that getting involved in the political was better than being politically apathetic or intellectually elitist especially when people were suffering in his context from the ravages of a capitalist economy and political system that rendered far too many people poor and disenfranchised. So it was that despite what at times might have been a tendency toward arrogance or patronizing tones, Anglican theologians like Maurice, Ludlow, and Kingsley were compelled into action by what they articulated as the biblical emphasis on justice and poverty, which they critiqued Anglican clergy for too often ignoring. Does that sound familiar? William Temple, for his part, as you make clear, argued that the teachings of Christ condemned selfishness and injustice which should be an obligatory matter for all Christians. I would say this is worth hearing today. Essentially, deeply embedded with the, within the Anglican theological tradition is a radical call for the church to be engaged in, if not leading the way, in agitating against systems and structures of injustice, so to lead the way, or perhaps in Maurice's way of thinking, to make visible the kingdom of God, that is God's just future for us all. Ironically, while those who have given birth to this tradition are often considered by many in our church as a classical Anglican theologians, often ignored are the most challenging social justice implications of their theologies, as those implications evolve, involve a commitment to social justice defined by the freedom and inclusiveness of all people, notwithstanding the fact that Maurice did not believe in universal suffrage. Nevertheless, Maurice's observation that the church had yet become what it was supposed to be remains germane today. And so we remain hopeful, as did Maurice, that the church will indeed become what it is supposed to be. The point of the matter is, Gary, that your book is timely, particularly as our church prepares for a Lambeth conference in which the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, has said that the spouses of same-sex unions are not welcome. Perhaps it would do good for the bishops of the American church and across the Anglican communion to revisit the theologies of those they hold so dear and be reminded of the biblical and gospel mandate they uphold, that upholds equality and inclusiveness. At the same time, it would be instructive for our Episcopal clergy to be, re, to be reacquainted with the moral courage, if you will, of the Maurices, Ludlow, Temples, Tawnies, and others who embodied their very beliefs by speaking out and acting them out in the public square in solidarity with the poor and oppressed of their time. Perhaps such a reacquaintance would prompt them to be more courageous, that is, our Episcopal clergy, in speaking out against the Make America White Again vision that the majority of white Christian America voted for. And on a more personal note, as dean of EDS at Union, an Anglican sem seminary committed to bringing faith and theological scholarship together in the service of social justice as is Union, hence fostering theological and ministerial leadership likewise committed. Reading your book 
affirm that this distinct path that we are trying to carve here at EDS is reflective of the best of our Anglican theological heritage. We pray that we may carry it forward. Moreover, as one who is also a womanist theologian, your book reminded me that being a womanist Episcopalian is not so strange a contradiction after all. In the end, Gary, in your very fine book, Social Democracy in the Making, amongst other things, you have reminded us of a transformative Anglican theological tradition that was Christian socialism. May this book be transformative for the church. And I thank you for your work and commitment to transformative scholarship. Good evening. I've been an admirer of Gary Dorian's writings and of this seminary for a long time, and it's a pleasure and an honor to be here to celebrate Gary's book. I'm going to begin with a confession as well. We did not, Kelly and I did not plan this. Some years ago, when I was in graduate school studying democratic socialist political thought, I read Gary's earlier book, The Democratic Socialist Vision, and I confess, Gary, I skipped the chapter on William Temple. I went straight to the chapters on the American socialist leaders I knew about, Norman Thomas, Michael Harrington, and I, th I think what I was thinking at the time was something like, what is this British bishop doing in a book about socialism? That was my mistake. I promised to read the chapter, but now I know much more about Temple because of Gary's new book. Uh, but more importantly, I think that my mistake is characteristic of many young people learning about democratic socialist traditions. And that's an important question right now because I would guess that now there are more young people in the United States asking what does it mean to be a democratic socialist? How can I be a socialist? Than there have been certainly at any time in my lifetime prior to now. As a college teacher, the version of that question I get usually, the, the how can I be a socialist question, is what should I read? And it would be possible to take Gary's book as a 600-page answer to that question. It's a wealth of studies of individual th uh, thinkers. But what emerges from the book, the best thing that emerges from the book is not simply the insights into individual thinkers, but a larger story. And the story, briefly put, goes something like this. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, socialist intellectual life, socialist thought, was a rich and varied ecosystem of ideas. And over the course of the 20th century, socialist thought has, at least the visible, obvious forms of socialist thought, the range has narrowed. There's been an impoverishment of socialist thought. And so the major achievement, I think, of Gary's book is to recover alternative traditions and legacies that have largely been neglected. And the most uh, prominent of those of the, in the book, of course, is the Christian socialist traditions of Britain and Germany. We have come to think of socialism as a secular political tradition, and it has those components, of course. But Gary's book shows that secular and Christian socialisms in Western Europe developed in dialogue with one another, and to a large extent, those of us who think about socialist thought today miss half of that dialogue. We miss the William Temples and the Paul Tillichs and the F.D. Morrises. So I want to say briefly a few things that emerge from Gary's book as common themes among many of the Christian socialists he writes about. And then I want to talk just a little bit about some of the interesting differences because those are important too. And I should say before I go farther, I think it's an interesting question how far the things Gary's book reveals about Christian socialism might also be true of religious socialism more broadly. But because Gary's book is specifically about the British and German traditions in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, necessarily we're talking about Christian socialism rather than religious socialism broadly. So with that said, some things that Christian socialists have brought 
to socialist intellectual life include, first, the sense that socialism is a modern restatement of an ancient impulse, that it is a, not a, an extension of the modern urge to master the world. It's not simply a restatement of the modern idea of progress, the idea that the human quest to master the world according to our own will proceeds inevitably. Socialism instead is a, re a modern reiteration of the ancient prophetic impulse to critique and to challenge that urge to mastery. Second, the ethical core of uh, the socialist tradition, as Gary and Kelly have both said, is this commitment to social justice and democratic community. But one of the themes that arises from Gary's book is that the core of that idea is a notion of fellowship or community. That social, Christian socialists have characteristically objected to capitalism, objected to the economic inequality that capitalism creates because that inequality impedes authentic experiences of community. Similarly then, that, uh, that emphasis on fellowship has often led, has characteristically led democratic socialists of a, of a religious bent to emphasize decentralization, participation, cooperation, themes that the more state-centered versions of socialist thought have often neglected. The idea of fellowship and the idea of face-to-face -face democratic commitments forms of political participation that are more human scaled, uh, those ideas fit naturally together and Christian socialists in Britain and Germany alike, as Gary shows, have often emphasized them. It's not an accident also that it's among religious socialists that we most often find serious attention to what we could call the problem of hope. The Marxist tradition, as well as the uh, progressive traditions like Fabianism in Britain tend to assume that history leads toward better things. But we know that's not true. If we didn't know that already that that's not true, 2016 should have taught us. <laughs> and if we're no longer confident in that vision of inevitable progress, we have to come face to face with the question of hope, with recognizing the need for something more than what Gary at the end of the book calls a bare moral ideal, something more than simply a statement of values. It's not enough to say we're opposed to economic inequality, we need to know why. And it's not enough to say that a desire for community is the reason we oppose economic inequality. We have to have some way of sustaining that commitment and that concern with hope and with what sustains values has often been the characteristic concern of religious socialists. So with that said, there are some fascinating differences that emerge in Gary's book between the British and the German traditions, the two uh, countries on which he focuses in this book. To some extent, the differences between the British and German socialist, uh, Christian socialist traditions have to do with political institutional differences. Gary emphasizes in the book, for example, the fact that the British Labor Party from the beginning had an open structure based on affiliated membership so that it was ideologically pluralist and had much more room inside it for Christian as well as secular socialists. The German party, the German Social Democratic Party, by the 1890s at least, had a much more centralized, disciplined structure that fit well with having a single dominant ideology within the party, which by the 1890s was Marxism. So that's part of the reason why there's a different relationship uh, in those two countries between Christian socialists and secular socialists. But there are also, it emerges in Gary's book, interesting theological differences here with the British Christian socialists being predominantly Anglican and the German Christian socialists or German speaking Christian socialists being mostly, although not entirely, from the Lutheran tradition. And so I think it's probably not a coincidence that those two religious socialist traditions develop in such different ways. We, among the Anglican, especially the second generation of Anglican socialists, the sacramental socialists, some historians have called them, there's an emphasis on the liturgical and sacramental practices of the church as a model for thinking about politics, the inclusive and egalitarian community of the Eucharist or of baptism. 
was under, often understood by the Anglican socialists to be the inspiration and the model for what a socialist vision of society should be like. And so it's, I, I suppose one way to say it is that the Anglican socialist tradition has often had a sense that there is something sacred about human sociality, about coming together as a community, that that is a, a, a way that we encounter the divine. Certainly there's a Tory version of that where the monarch and the aristocrats and the commoners, the social hierarchy is the model for our relationship to the divine. But there's a socialist version of that too, which Gary's book brings out beautifully. The idea that it's in an egalitarian community, a democratic community, that we understand what it's like to encounter the divine and that in our, in, I think it would be fair to say both ways, right? In, in an encounter with the divine, we come to understand the need for egalitarian and democratic communities. And so one of the interesting motifs that pops up in Gary's discussion of the Anglican socialists, which doesn't seem like a coincidence, is the notion of beauty. The notion that the problem with capitalism is in part that it imposes ugliness on the lives of the poor. The problem with capitalism is that it deprives us of genuinely shared experiences of beauty, genuinely shared experiences of what is good. Those themes seem to me to be the, the special genius of the Anglican socialist tradition. The German Christian socialist tradition has very different emphases. For many of the German Christian socialists, there's a sharp opposition of a secular socialist movement interested in pursuing power and a church community that, or a church institution that is removed from that. So for example, it was a character, it seems to have been a characteristic experience for the German Christian socialists to say, the church has failed to do the work of pursuing social justice and the existence of a secular socialist movement is a challenge to the church, shows the church its own failure. Uh, there's an interesting connection there, which I had certainly never understood before, between the challenge to churchly Christianity of someone like Karl Barth. Um, that I found absolutely fascinating. But the point for thinking about politics here is that in the German Christian socialist tradition, on the one hand, there's both a, a lack, a, a gap, that the Anglican tradition fills, but also an insight that the Anglican tradition at least at times lacks. The Anglican tradition delights, the Anglican socialist tradition delights in sociality, in community, in public experiences. And so it makes sense that it's among the Anglican socialists that we find this fascination with direct participation, uh, with guild or decentralized forms of socialism. The German Christian socialist tradition seems to lack that delight in the church as an institution or a community, that delight in sociality itself. And so it's not surprising that the German Christian socialists often lack that interest in decentralized participatory forms of socialism. The other side of this though, the thing that worries, as much as I have come to love through Gary's writings and others, love the Anglican socialist tradition, and by the way, my answer to young people looking for things to read about socialism now would be, you've got to read the Anglican Socialists. You've got to read Tawny and Temple. Um, the, as much as I've come to love that tradition, the thing that worries me is that at times, especially with the first generation of the Anglican Socialists, but with some others as well, there's a sense that politics, socialist politics, ought to actually enact or bring about what we in an American tradition might call the beloved community. In the German socialist, Christian socialist tradition, often there's a much stronger sense of the distinctiveness of political life, a sense that political life is not an area of love. It is a zone of conflict and contestation and that nothing can change that. And so in the German, among the German Christian socialists, there's much more acceptance of conflict, acceptance of the necessity of conflict among the Anglican Christian socialists, mostly with Maurice, but I think with some of the others as well. Often there's a turn away from political conflict, a retreat into service, moral witness, education, and as important as service, moral witness, and education are, 
in the world we live in, they are no substitute for engaging in political conflict. So my problem here, I guess this is a question. I think both traditions are right. And I think both traditions are wrong. And the things that are right and the things that are wrong about each tradition seem tangled up with one another. I'm not sure what to do with that. Uh, the answer that Gary's book, I think, gives, at least this is what I take from it, and it seems to me the best available answer, at least I can't think of a better one, is that we simply live with this set of contradictions. There's a tension between secular and religious socialisms. There's a tension between the delight in sociality but fear of conflict in the Anglican tradition and the openness to conflict but lack of delight in sociality of the German Christian socialist tradition. Perhaps the best we can do is to simply sit with these tensions. Thank you. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, well, we have entered that phase when um, we can uh, have discussion, uh, questions, and the like. Um, and I think before, I think I'll go to you first, Michael. So, um, but I just want to say, uh, firstly, to thank you to, to both of you. Um, firstly, Kelly, to call up that. Uh, that whole litany of, of Anglican theologians in the Anglican tradition, it, did, it reminded me of uh, not only just how great really this tradition is, but, but also it's somewhat almost shaming to me to consider what it was that Temple, certainly someone like Charles Gore, felt that they not only could do, but absolutely must say in a church context, don't care whether it's Lent one or Epiphany, or you know what 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 day uh, of the of the liturgical season uh, it is uh, that um, certain things that need to be said that are the church's business that in our hearing just sound kind of rankly almost harshly political uh, in a way that our you know our the, the way we have gotten church has just gotten so much of this of the social justice witness and just the sheer sort of tenacity of the, the moral witness in the gospel is just stripped out in the way we do church in this way that we, we kind of gather people together to br give them experiences in a kind of innocuous way, innocuous way that doesn't really mean anything and um that uh it it reminded me while writing it and then while listening to you as well that um they they did have that uh, in a way that even somewhat speaks to, to, to Jeffrey's point, because I, I know very well, I agree with you. Uh, it was just a superb uh, sketch uh, of what I'm doing in that book. But if you look at, say, certainly Gore, uh, when he preaches or anytime he speaks to a convention, he is lacerating about what he calls the sins of the church. Um, and uh, so he is not, uh, and, and that's, that is, uh, Charles Gore is, probably the most important, prominent, influential Anglican churchman of the 20th century. Uh, so there's not a negligible figure by any means, and, but, but there's even sort of a toleration uh, for that uh, in, in their tradition that, uh, let's just say, shall we say, uh, we have a harder time with right here, right? <clears throat> uh, and no matter how brave uh, you and I can try to be uh, when I'm going out there uh, speaking, you know, we're aware of what the limit is. And uh, all these folks that we just talked about, they all went way over that line. Um, Jeffrey, uh, <laughs> listening to you so beautifully describe the contours of the book and what it's trying to do and get it in the different parts of it in a conversation with each other. You both just left out all the Marxism, which is just as fine. But, uh, but uh, listening how how you did it, what it made me think was that, yes, if, if I had done this event in a church context, that's exactly what I would have gone for. Um, and yet, tonight, I went for a fairly hard-edged political argument. Uh, I mean, it's that way of sort of summarizing what the book is about, right? I went for, I only went for a couple of things uh, in my talk. You actually filled out part, parts of the book that I barely, barely took a gesture um, at. So I'm very grateful to, uh, to you for that. I'm also, it's also left me wondering, something I'm going to have to think about, uh, about the choice even that I made uh, tonight and how 
uh, I uh, summarized what I'm up to in this book, but I'm very grateful to you for, uh, for filling that out. So, Michael, let's start with you. We've got an icebreaker question. Where speakers are always grateful yes. for that brave soul who's willing to ask the first question. Well, I hope and so. And Michael has played this role several times in things I've done in New York City. I'm Rabbi Michael Feinberg. I direct the Greater New York Labor Religion Coalition, and I'm co-chair of the Religion and Socialism Task Force here in New York City of DSA. First, I want to say thank you, Professor Dorian and the two respondents, for giving us hope to remind us of a history that's often forgotten that we need to remember at a time when the culture and the politics are so attenuated and so drained of any hope. But I, I'd like to pose a challenge. What would this dialogue have sounded like if you brought in Jewish socialists or Islamic socialists or Buddhist socialists? And maybe you shouldn't have dialogues that are just Christian socialists, because I fear that that, in some subtle way, is a form of Christian triumphalism, just on a progressive side, which is, I don't know if that's any better than the other brands of Christian triumphalism that we've been dealt. And then the other thing is, on the one hand, is overly deterministic economic uh, economic determinism posed against what could be called hallmark card, uh, vague value socialism. I don't want either. I think Buber and Marx can be reconciled. I'm not sure how to do that, but I'm afraid we could veer to either one of them, and they're not going to get us out of where we, we need to get out of. Thank you, Michael. That wonderful question. Um, I should say, first of all, the social democracy has actually got lots of Jewish socialists uh, in there. It wouldn't be possible, really, to tell the story, even if you were trying to keep them out. How could you, uh, given what the subject matter um, is, including even how, you know, some of their sort of reflection about the issue about what they do with their own sort of uh, religious background or uh, the, the story that goes on with someone like Bernstein about sort of when he gives it up or, or the, within, within the, the story of the SPD, there's a, there's a story to tell there about how it was okay to be more, more explicitly religious and there comes a point after the persecution period when that's really not the case any longer and they're saying things at those secret congresses that are, even though officially we have a two-track way of dealing with religion, i.e., it's, it's okay privately if you want to be an idiot, but you know, uh, in, in terms of the, 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 the movement itself, here's what we need to say. Uh, so the book's got a lot of that, that uh, kind of discussion um, in it. And when I get to the American story, it will have even more. I mean, it's just there, it's even, I'm, I'm more, um, in the American book, I will be, um, it's, it's a, actually a category uh, in a way that it becomes something that has to be dealt with that, that deals with to what extent Morris Hillquit has still you know, got a, a Jewish idea of the scriptural witness that is in his head but he can't quite acknowledge. Uh, and that then takes you to, to a figure like Michael Lerner or Arthur, Arthur Waskow. So that, is, that whole line is, it will be lined out in, ex in exactly the way um, that you uh, uh, call for uh, in that book. In, the, in this book, though there's lots of Jewish socialists uh, in there, I do have, I do have kind of a fourfold frame uh, here. And, to, and my worry is going to be that I've, got, I've, got, I've already got more religion in here than, uh, <laughs> than some of my readers are going to be able to tolerate. I've got, there's someone who wrote a blurb uh, for this book on the back that I just kind of blush thinking of him, knowing him, uh, thinking of those long theological discussions that he must have had to read, or at least, uh, you know, encountered uh, reading this book. I hadn't realized that Yale was going to send it to him, but, you know, there it is. He's on the cover. Um, and um, so I, I am a little bit sort of self-conscious about just how much of a kind of deeply theological religious argument there is in here. And I've got so much stuff simply to, simply to hold on to a narrative that's put both Germany and Britain together, dealing with similarities and differences, and then making an argument about how um, there's the secular side that doesn't want to, that's bailing on religion or doesn't want to talk about it explicitly, and then, and yes, making an argument, making a pitch for all these Christians who were in fact in it, uh, who are, who are 
um, at every stage uh, on the scene and making uh, arguments that, yes, I want this seminary and others like it not to forget, um, not, you know, and, and to know about. Um, but there is, uh, there are things that get squeezed here, there, all over the place um, when, you, when you line out a, basically a fourfold argument like this one is. When I started this book, I, I had in mind I was going to get, it was going to be a three-way conversation. I wanted to get the U.S. Uh, into it, where if you go U.S., this problem of sort of cultural plurality that I'm straining to bring out of this German and British story just tells itself. I mean, you, just, you can't, it, it, that's what it is. That's what it always is. Uh, so the, that, that story is so constitutive to American democratic socialism, and in these other contexts, you have to work pretty hard just to bring it out at all. Um, so these are all framing issues I could go on, but you know, uh, that is the kind of thing that goes into trying to um, uh, work out a book of this sort and still come in under 650 pages. <laughs> in the spirit of Michael's question, I'd suggest, uh, for those of you who read Gary's book, which you should all do, a question to keep in mind as you read the sections about the Christian socialists is to notice the moments at which various thinkers make what I guess we could call exclusive or universal claims and the moments at which they make what I guess we could call, um, let's say, reiterative claims. I mean, there are moments in which the thinkers Gary writes about say things like Christianity is the only basis for socialism, the only basis for a decent politics. But there are other moments at which they make claims that suggest that Christian practices or Christian faith or Christian theology are a possible basis. And there may be other possible bases as well for socialist politics. I guess that's a readerly question and not a, a, an answer to the question, but I, there's an interesting variety among the thinkers within the book with that regard. Yes, in fact, I mean, the, the, that whole second half of the political theology chapter is about religious socialism. It actually isn't about Christian socialism per se. And to the extent that it's put out in those terms, it's an argument about why it can't just be Christian socialism. And that's, that's actually the whole, the whole point of that section. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Philip Lynn uh, from the Riverside Church, and um, I'm deeply grateful for the opportunity to be here tonight and to hear what the three of you have had to say. And I appreciate the incredible opportunity that I think this gathering presents. I have a specific question. Um, as somebody who is working to build the beloved community ministry at the Riverside Church, I'd be interested in hearing what role specifically the church individually and then collectively could play in bringing this vision into reality. We're here. What do we do? I think, and I, I'll say this in the uh, spirit of, uh, in the context of the book uh, that Gary offered us, I think we see, one, for uh, churchmen, and the, there were churchmen in this instance, uh, like Gore, like uh, F.D. Maurice, Maurice and others, that the question was not what role can the church play? It was the church must play a role. Because for persons like them, it was all about as the kingdom of Christ or, or the future that God promised. And so the church's role was to mediate that for uh, lack of a better word. So the church belonged not simply on the public square, but it seems to me that they believed that the church had to be in the forefront of bringing back, uh, bringing forward this more equitable uh, society. I believe in following in their tradition, 
and other traditions, but I'll keep with, with this, that that is precisely the role that the church ought to play. Because here's the thing, and even as they emphasize, people like uh, Maurice and others emphasize, quote unquote, uh, the uh, kingdom of Christ, that the church is by its very nature not in any way accountable to the status quo. It's supposed to be accountable to a more just future. And so it has no allegiance to the way things are. Its allegiance is to be to the way things are supposed to be. And so it seems to me that the church then has to be on the forefront of leading us toward this sort of more uh, just society. As I answer that, though I have a qu question that stems uh, from your book, but from uh, Jeff's comments, and that is, was it the end, he talks about the way in which the Anglican uh, theologians uh, and Christian socialists were, had this ideal of beauty and the divine, et cetera, which they did. How much of that was an influence, particularly in the uh, early thinkers, of the romantic, the romantics like Coleridge? Uh, and others? Well, it does precede them. Mm -hmm. um, this, and, and it even precedes what is the other easy answer, which is, ang well, this, which is just a description of Anglo-Catholicism, right? Right. Um, actually, that uh, beauty theme, the idea that there's a divine order that's already here that we just need to realize, um, is, is right. it, that's Morris. That's and, right. um, and, and that's the so-called broad church, we should say here. I mean, Anglicanism, as long as we're going this long on Anglicanism tonight, might as well explain, uh, there, there are basically three camps in the Anglican world. There's the Anglo-Catholic world, which is uh, very Catholic, uh, it's organic, sacramental uh, spirituality and conceptuality and approach to, to liturgy and, and the like, smells and bells. Uh, and uh, the other side of that, away on the other side, would be the Protestant or evangelical uh, side, which is much more, you know, uh, recognizably Protestant, stripping away a lot of those Catholic elements. And then there's this group in the middle. Uh, it's called the Broad Church uh, sensibility uh, within uh, Anglicanism that then becomes a third party uh, within Anglicanism. And you can find. Uh, the Christian socialist tradition in all three, but it's it is strongest among the Anglo Catholics, and to some to many folks that's counterintuitive because they think of Anglo Catholicism as being conservative, right? Uh, how is it that you could get such a social justice witness coming out of that place? Um, it starts with the fact that Anglo Catholicism didn't move to the suburbs. Uh, and long before it happened here, it's happening in England, uh, and they didn't head out there. They're going to stay. Uh, and they stayed administered uh, to the poor. And the poor uh, had very little history of ever feeling welcome at church anyway uh, in all of England. And now in these Anglo-Catholic congregations, uh, they said, well, that's a scandal. That's a judgment on Christianity when the poor don't feel welcome uh, at church. And so the sheer work of, of ministering uh, to the poor and having um, a theology and a sacramental sensibility that that believes indeed that uh, beauty is important, uh, that, uh, th that, that your faith should bring beauty uh, into your life, uh, that, um, that the, the, the divine order itself is beautiful. We're the ones who just keep messing it up. Um, that's, that's the Anglo-Catholic uh, sensibility. The broad church people are saying, can't you two stop fighting and we you know, hold it together? And indeed, the, the broad church is the group that has a history uh, of holding this whole three three camp thing um, together. Now Morris is so broad church that he actually doesn't call himself that. He thinks this whole party system in, in, in the Church of England has been problematic, and he wants to you know he wants to uh, eliminate the whole party system altogether. Um, but uh, looking at him from a later time, it's not too hard to place him. Uh, you know, he's a broad church type who's always just trying to hold it together. <clears throat> So this will be our last question. Oh, wow. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Jason. Thank you for the event. Um, a quick plug. We have the DSA has been mentioned, the Democratic Socialists of America. We have material back here and for the Religion and Socialism Working Group. And I'm, a question, I, I'm guessing you dealt with this in the book. Early, I maybe misheard you too, you mentioned uh, Bernstein as having an ethical socialism that it seemed like you wanted. 
And then later you talked about the struggle between the Fabians and Christian socialists on colonialism. But from what I know, Bernstein brought the colonialism of the Fabians into that, his same myths. And so I'm just wondering how you parse that out. Because in one case, you're siding with the Christian socialists against the uh, Fabians, but then it seemed like you were siding with Bernstein yes. in this other case where he seemed to be on that same side. So yes. just to push that well, conversation. Oh, thank you, Jason. Well, it's a wonderful question. Um, Edward Bernstein is one of the great figures of democratic socialism. He is the first, he is the one who just rocked the whole SPD by making an argument for that it's got to be democratic and we shouldn't, we shouldn't brag about being transcending ethics or, or, or any such thing. Um, and he has a mostly commendable uh, career, I would say early, middle, and late, but he is a, he's a very complicated figure. I mean, he's, will, he's one of those people on, on August 4th who is willing to vote for war um, in, in, in 1914. Uh, he regrets it very soon. Uh, so very soon after Germany went to war, Bernstein is willing to stand up and, and take what's going to come uh, from saying, no, this is mostly on us. Invading Be Belgium is, is, is obscene. Uh, and, and doing what we have done uh, to cause the, the First World War uh, is a horror, and it's, it's, on, you know, it's on our uh, consciences. Um, and he's a figure in, in, in helping to found a uh, democratic socialist party that becomes an alternative to the SPD during the war. Um, and then after uh, the war and so on, I think he plays a mostly commendable uh, role in trying to hold together the old SPD and the independent S uh, SPDB. A and if that had happened, um, democratic socialism could have turned out differently in Germany. As it was, the independent social democrats who held out against the war during the war end up going into the common turn and the rump group ends up going back at the SPD and an enormously important opportunity was lost. And Bernstein in this later case, yes, is, is an example of someone who's doing something that I think, you know, was exemplary and, and consistent uh, with his democratic socialism. But he's a, he's a, he's a complicated human being uh, with, with historical, who's historically conditioned with all manner of, uh, you know, the limitations uh, that come uh, with his history and his time and the, and the like. Um, and so I, re I remember vividly uh, the first time I got to this section of what's not, uh, you know, the, the well-known part of his uh, famous book. You have to work toward the end of it. And some of editions didn't even have this. Where I see him making with basically Fabian arguments for saying that, um, well, you know, colonialism is complicated. And there's, there's a, there are better kinds and there are kinds that are, you know, that are horrible. Uh, and actually Brit Britain is, is at, that, at that, uh, that side of it that's really not so bad. It's, it's bad. We need to overcome it. And if we get so socialism, we'll be able to overcome it. But, but, uh, you know, he, the argument made against him, and I think here, this part of it was right, um, that he just cultivated too many Fabian friends uh, during his years in England, and he ended up seeing the world more from their perspective uh, than was good for his own, his own, you know, the, the, the line that he took. So, so he would come up better, certainly, from, by our lights uh, on, on that, you know, that uh, uh, network of issues. But... Um, there's also, there's one other thing, since I'm this far into it, um, to say about even that, and that was when he wrote that, he wants very much to be let back into Germany. He needs to prove, and then this, now this is a, just a perennial problem for democratic socialism. The whole problem of, are you a good, whatever, are you a good German? Are you a good Britain? Are you a good American? Uh, if you've got this much loyalty to this kind, this idea that really does transcend nationalism and does does have to seem, have a very deep critique of any kind of nationalism, how do you? How can we be assured that we that we can trust you, that we can vote for you? Tillich struggled with this question mightily in Socialist Decision. In fact, it virtually takes over the Socialist Decision in 1913, and this is exactly his problem. And I would say the answer that he came out with was not very good, but then you have to, you have to rerun almost the same, the same consideration 
um, that these are historically situated figures who are in political contexts, who are trying to move the needle within political contexts, and the most devastating thing you can ever, you can always say against democratic socialists is that they're not trustworthy on the patriotism question. And Bernstein was trying to make, trying to clean himself up when he wrote that, that section uh, of his great book, because he's still in exile 20 years later in England, and he wants to go home. Um, so, you know, there's even that. <clears throat> Um, so I um, hate to close this part of our discussion. Um, Kelly and Jeff, thank you so much for your um, comments. Uh, thank you all for coming. At the back of the chapel, we have um, wine and seltzer and cheese and books to sell. And let me just end by saying, Gary, thank you for this remarkable book and for your work. And Let's end with a round of applause for our guests.